SEP Fanfic Readings presents Finding Hermione by Ebook Dragon Chapter 42 Nothing Precious is Ever Easy Evening of January 16th They returned to the parlor. Blaze gave Hermione a wide berth, and Draco had a feeling he was practicing his shield charms just in case. The sum of the group were gathered around a plate of cookies on the table. Theo shot Draco a curious look when they entered the room again. Draco shook his head. Their conversation with Blaze and Tracy wasn't something that needed to be revealed right at this moment. "'Do you have it?' Draco asked Theo when he got close to him. Theo patted his jacket pocket. "'Is now the time?' Draco looked around the room. Rose and Albus were getting whiny. Hermione was also looking a little tired after coming down from her adrenaline rush. Ginny seemed to be wilting around the edges, too. Daphne's head was lolling back on her armchair, and she was snoring delicately. "'Yes, the kids are getting tired.' We'll need to go soon, Draco answered. Theo drew the roll of parchment out of his pocket and handed it to Draco. If I could have your attention for a moment, Theo called to the room. Draco has something important he needs to say. Attention in the room shifted to Draco. Daphne snorted as she jerked awake. Theo sat on the armchair beside her and wrapped an arm around Daphne's shoulders. Daphne leaned her head on her husband's hip and yawned delicately into her hand. If you could all take a seat. Draco started, gesturing at the seat circled around the round coffee table. Draco waited until everyone took a seat, then he started again. A few months ago, I promised Hermione a seat on the Wisingamont so that she could cast a vote for her own bill. It should have been given to her years ago. That statement was made with a few hear hears from everyone in the room. Rose and Albus joined in repeating hear hear several times after being shushed by their mothers. Draco brandished the scroll to the room. This is a deed giving Hermione and her heirs the right to occupy the Lestrange seat in perpetuity, and rename it. "'Will it work?' Daphne asked, her voice full of concern. "'No one's ever given a seat to a non-family member.' "'The family magic worked into the seat has died since the last of Lestrange died out. The seat itself merely waits for another occupant to claim it,' Draco started to explain. "'Wait, wait,' Greg interrupted. "'Are you sure that's right?' Remember the story of Barty Crouch, Senior's elder brother? Well, half-brother, as it turns out. The seat damn near burned his arse off when he tried to take it from his father. Well, the man he thought he was his father. It caused quite the scandal to find out old Mrs. Crouch had a few cuckoos in the nest. Draco remembered hearing the story. It had been passed around as a lesson not to try to take another seat at the council table. It also served as a warning to the wives of the Wisingamot members not to cuckold their husbands. Or at least make sure children don't result from illicit liaisons. Not that he could blame some of the pure-blood wives for seeking pleasure elsewhere. Draco was relieved that arranged marriages were a thing of the past. "'Yes, I remember the story, too,' Draco said, calling attention back to himself and not the buzzing conversation swirling around them. "'Hermione's safety is my utmost concern. I wouldn't be suggesting this if I thought she would be harmed in any way.' The reassurances seemed to mollify the group, and Draco continued. "'Magically speaking, the council seat will accept just about anyone in that seat now.' Legally, as I inherited the Lestrange fortunes and properties, and the Wisingamot did not strip me of my rights after the war, I can do anything I want with the seat. The seat is considered property, so it can be given over to another person or inherited. All right, Theo interjected. Does everyone understand what's going on? People stopped asking questions and nodded. Theo used his wand, and the coffee table rose to hip height. He stood on one side of the table facing Hermione and Draco. Draco, Hermione— "'If you'll stand here in front of the table,' Theo directed, and they did as asked. "'Draco, place the scroll on the table, and both of you place the tips of your wands on the wax seals, beside your names.' Draco rolled out the parchment. He had to be the one to open it, or the magic in the scroll would erase the deed to keep it from being found before Draco wanted it to. Across the top were the words, "'Deed of Conveyance, written in Old English Script. The Lestrange family coat of arms dominated the center of the parchment,' with the Malfoy coat of arms on the left and a blank space with the outline for a coat of arms on the right. Below the coats of arms was all the legal jargon for transferring Draco's rights of the Lestrange seat to Hermione. Draco and Hermione's names were written in neat script down at the bottom of the deed, along with two blank seals. Three seals lined each side under Draco and Hermione, with blank lines for their witnesses. The group left their seats to gather on either side of Draco and Hermione. Harry stood close beside Hermione, with Ginny, Neville, Hannah, and Luna beside him. Narcissa stood between Draco and Hermione. 
Greg, Helena, Blaze, Tracy, and Daphne lined up on the other side of Draco. Theo tapped his wand over a blank seal between the places for Draco and Hermione's labeled officiator. Navy blue filled the blank seal. Atop the blue ink was a black circular shield with a Celtic warrior knot in silver. A circle topped the knot, and inside was a pair of crossed wands, and the phrase, Invictus Maneo, scrolled around the outside ring of the circle, along with Theo's full name. I remain unconquered. Theo looked at Dreyful and said officially, Do you, Draco Lucius Malfoy, willingly cede all rights and responsibilities of the Lestrange seat to Hermione Jean Granger? I do, Draco said to Theo, and then smiled down at Hermione. Do you bestow these rights to Hermione and her heirs in perpetuity? I do, Draco said again. As the House of Lestrange is no more, do you allow Hermione to change the seat to reflect the new house now occupying it? I do, Draco said, and his personal seal appeared on the white waxy surface, a silvery blue dragon standing guard in front of a golden tree with golden apples hanging from the branches. The tail of the dragon circled the trunk of the tree, its large barbed tail acting as a deterrent to those that would steal the apples. Around the outside circle of the seal were the words, Quarite e Redemptio, along with Draco's name. I seek redemption. Theo smiled and turned to Hermione. Do you, Hermione Jean Granger, accept the seat of the former House of Lestrange? I do, Hermione said with confidence. Do you vow to rule on the Wisingamot with wisdom and fairness? I do. Do you vow on your magic to put the concerns and the welfare of the Wizarding Britain before your personal gain, or beliefs when acting as a Wisingamot council member? I do. Hermione intoned a final time. Hermione's newly created personal seal appeared underneath her wand, and they all watched with rapt attention. Muddy waters appeared at the bottom of the seal. A fully bloomed red lotus flower floated on the muddy waters, with a blue sky filling in the rest of the circle. The ring around the seal filled in with her name and the words, Ego perpetuo reside. I am unbroken. Oohs and ahs filled the room as they all took in Hermione's personal seal. Quite a few looked like they wanted to start asking questions, but were staved off by Theo's hands indicating they should wait. Hermione Jean Granger, you are now a member of the Wisingamot Council. May you rule with justice and wisdom in your heart, Theo intoned. He looked over at Hermione and asked one final thing. Would you like to change the naming of the seat and now create your family coat of arms? Yes, Hermione answered. I'd like to rename the seat. It's time to allow the House of Lestrange to fade into history. Another round of hear-hears greeted Hermione's statement. Draco was pleased with this decision. They hadn't discussed it other than for Draco to let Hermione know that she could change the name. He didn't want to influence her decision one way or another. Place your wand over the blank coat of arms, Theo instructed. Draco watched in wonder as the blank coat of arms started to change. A wyvern and an owl cradled a shield between two outstretched wings. The shield was a quartered field of azure with a gold letter G in Old English dominating the center. Four heraldic symbols took up a quartered section of the shield. An open book occupied the top left quarter of the shield. A shooting comet took up the top right quadrant. A lion rampant stood on the bottom left. On the bottom right was a set of balanced scales. The wyvern and owl each clutched the end of the banner, with a motto written across its length that read, Nihil Presidium Adeptus Est Facile. Nothing precious is easily obtained. Very true, Theo said, looking at the banner across the bottom of the coat of arms. We need three witnesses for each side now to make this deed official, Theo continued. Harry slid the parchment over to him so that it was in front of him. He said with a smile, and placed his wand over a blank seal below Hermione's name. Harry's name appeared along with his seal, a phoenix rising from the ashes. The motto that appeared around the seal read, Ergo Renesitur, I am reborn. Harry kissed Hermione's temple, and he and Ginny moved aside to stand beside Theo on the other side of the table. Neville silently took Harry's place as a witness and placed his wand over a blank seal with little ceremony. A rearing golden lion appeared in the middle of a green field. The motto read, Ego sum dignus, I am worthy. Neville gave Hermione a quick hug and moved to stand beside Harry. Hannah quietly took Neville's place and placed her wand over the last blank seal. 
a white, orange, and black koi fish appeared in blue waters. Around the seal read the words, Difficultes et Encomida. I surmount all difficulties. Daphne gestured for the scroll to be passed to her. I'll represent our family, since Theo is unable to act as a witness. A dolphin swimming in a blue-green sea appeared on the seal below Draco's name. Her motto read, Ego acres tulit intrepidus. I am undaunted. Blaze took the scroll from Daphne and silently placed his wand over the seal next to hers. A fox romping in a meadow appeared in the empty seal, with the motto around the outside. Sono degno di amore. I am worthy of love. He smiled at Draco and Hermione. I hope this will begin to make up for my earlier idiocy. Draco grunted as a response. It was unclear whether the grunt was affirmative. Draco wasn't exactly ready to forgive. Blaze seemed to let the matter lie. Greg took the scroll from Blaze. He placed his wand over the last seal. A large, black bear with a mountain range behind him filled in his seal. His motto, Intra certamen ego inveni veris viras. Within the struggle, I found my true strength. Theo summoned the scroll from the end of the table. He rolled it up and secured it with a blue ribbon. Then he placed the scroll in Hermione's hands. Congratulations, Hermione. You are now a member of the Wizengamot at long last, Theo congratulated. Draco wrapped an arm around Hermione, and she beamed up at him as she wrapped her arm around his waist. Thank you for this, Hermione said quietly. Draco kissed her softly. You deserve it. Hermione whistled loudly, calling all attention to her. I just want to tell you all thank you for being a part of this. It means so much to Draco and I that you are a part of our lives. Hermione released her hold on Draco's waist and moved off in one direction to say goodbye to their friends. Draco moved off in another. He hugged Greg and kissed Helena on the cheek. Tracy was over talking to Hermione. Draco wrapped an arm around Blaze's neck in a tight hold. The next time you call a child of mine a little shit, mate, you won't need to fear Hermione, because they'll never find your body. Blaze's dark skin took on a satisfying grayish cast. Draco dropped his hold on Blaze and faced him. Blaze rubbed his neck and looked uncomfortable. I'm really sorry about that, Draco. I know I overreacted, but she's my little girl. I don't want her growing up knowing that she has no choice in whom she marries. Blaze said in a tone that pleaded for Draco to understand. Blaze gestured over to the sofa where Rose and Albus were sleeping. How would you feel if someone told you that their son was destined to marry your daughter? Draco kept his gaze on Rose's angelic face. I hear Azkaban isn't that bad anymore, Draco said lightly. Aside from the company, he added derisively. He turned and faced Blaze seriously. I understand wanting to protect your daughter, but I'm not going to tolerate my son being disrespected. He didn't ask for this either. As a parting remark, Draco said, Just so you know, when we told Scorpius about the cuff, his first concern was your daughter and not taking away her choice. His first reaction was to put your daughter's happiness above his own. Draco left Blaze standing in the middle of the room, looking flabbergasted and slightly defensive. Draco walked over to where Rose and Albus were sleeping soundly on the sofa. Harry stood in front of them, gazing down at the two angelic-looking children. "'They always look so sweet when they're asleep,' Harry said in greeting when Draco drew up level with him. "'I think it's nature's way of reminding you not to strangle them when they're acting like a bunch of demons,' Draco responded. Harry huffed a quiet laugh. Draco looked around the room to make sure they weren't going to be overheard. Hermione was talking with his mother and Helena now. Draco grabbed Harry's arm, and Harry looked over curiously at him. "'What was the look for at dinner?' Draco whispered. Harry looked down at the children before he returned his gaze to Draco. "'Nothing,' he answered. "'Don't lie to me,' Draco whispered harshly. "'I saw you when Hermione's pregnancy with Rose was mentioned. What was wrong with Hermione's pregnancy?' Draco's gut clenched at the thought of unknown complications. Hermione never mentioned anything, but Draco was sure she wouldn't want him to worry more than he already was. "'It's nothing, Draco,' Harry said quietly. There was a firmness in his voice that Draco had never heard before. "'There was nothing wrong with her pregnancy.' "'You're not going to fold me off with that non-answer. What the hell was that look?' Harry shrugged off Draco's hand and resumed looking down at the children. "'I'll never tell,' he said quietly." A chill settled over Draco at those quietly whispered words. That day at the ministry came flooding back to him. Harry's bruised knuckles, Weasley's battered face, a hatred that Draco had never seen in Harry before. Draco hadn't wanted to think about what Harry knew. 
He'd been actively trying to put it from his mind. Now this, those words. Draco's mind started racing. Hermione's pregnancy with Rose. She hadn't wanted more children after Minerva. Hermione's oblivion after Minerva's fall off the broom. A thought so horrible, Draco's mind refused to even think the words. No, he choked out. No, no, no. Control your face, Harry said harshly, looking over his shoulder. She can't know. She doesn't need to know. How can you expect me to? Draco started. Harry interrupted. Look at her, he said as he gestured at the sleeping rose. Harry turned and nodded his head over in Hermione's direction. And her. Hermione was smiling and laughing. She was surrounded by her friends. Harry continued. They're happy. They're better off now. Harry bent down over the sofa. Draco watched as Harry brushed a red curl off Rose's face and kissed her cheek. He scooped up Albus. He straightened and patted his son's back soothingly. How am I supposed to know this and not say anything to her? Draco protested vehemently. I love her. I don't know if I can keep this from her. Do you think that I don't love her? She's been my best friend since we were children, like a sister to me. You'll do it for the same reason I do, Harry said quietly. The only thing he did right was leave her with no memory of what he did to her. The best thing we can do is not tell her about what she doesn't remember. Draco nodded and sat heavily on the sofa beside Rose. She murmured a sleepy protest, needing some comfort. Draco picked Rose up and held her limp form in his lap. She curled into his side and held onto his shirt. They'd sat like this so many times, his sweet Rose. "'Does knowing what you know now change how you feel about Rose?' he asked, looking down at the two of them. "'No,' Draco answered truthfully. "'He deserves to die, Harry.' Harry looked coldly at him. "'Death would be too quick for him.' Ginny called over to Harry. Harry looked at his wife, then turned back to Draco. "'Have a good night, Draco. Try not to think about it too much.' Harry left Draco sitting on the sofa cuddling Rose. Draco watched as Harry rocked over to Hermione and Ginny. Harry hugged Hermione and wrapped an arm around Ginny's shoulders. Draco should have asked Harry how he did it, how he acted normal around Hermione without giving anything away. Hermione walked over and sat down beside him. Draco wrapped his free arm around her shoulders. She smiled up at him, her gaze so full of love. Draco didn't think he could turn that gaze into one of pain and horror. He couldn't tell her. He wouldn't tell her if he didn't have to. I love you, Draco said simply. Those three little words weren't enough to convey how he felt about her. That he would do anything for her, even suffer with his knowledge alone to protect her. Hermione leaned forward and placed a soft kiss on his lips. I love you too. Theo cleared his throat, and they turned their attention to Daphne and Theo sitting in the chair beside them. Theo had drawn Daphne down to sit on his lap. Draco saw Theo's thumb graze over the skin of Daphne's waist under Daphne's shirt. "'Are you ready for tomorrow?' Theo asked. "'I think I'm ready as we'll ever be,' Hermione said. Hermione took a shaky breath. She placed a hand on his thigh. "'We wanted to tell you something, without the others around.' Daphne cast them a concerned look. "'Is everything all right?' "'It's about Scorpius,' Hermione said. "'When we took Minerva back to school, Scorpius pulled me aside and asked me to be his mother.' and I said that I would. Daphne looked shocked. Are you going to adopt him like Draco adopted Minerva? Erase his mother from his blood, she asked tearfully. Theo rubbed Daphne's back soothingly. Hermione leaned forward and looked directly at Daphne. She spoke kindly but firmly to Daphne. I am not going to adopt him like Draco adopted Minerva. There is no need, and I'm not going to disrespect Astoria's memory by doing that. Hermione sat back and took Draco's hand in her own, Daphne nodded at Hermione. "'This isn't about Astoria,' Draco said sympathetically to Daphne. "'Scorpius wants a mother. He needs more than just the stories we can tell him about his mother.' Daphne sniffed. "'I don't want my sister to be forgotten.' "'She won't, Daphne,' Draco said. "'But I'm not going to deny Scorpius this. It's what's best for him, and I think Astoria would agree.' "'Thank you for telling us this without the others around,' Theo said quietly. Daphne nodded and slid off her husband's lap. She came over to their sofa and sat beside Hermione. "'I'm sure Astoria would approve of you taking care of Scorpius, since she couldn't be here to do it herself,' Daphne said to Hermione. Hermione hugged Daphne. Draco heard Hermione murmur to Daphne, "'Thank you for understanding.' 
Draco stood and settled Rose higher up in his arms. Rose buried her face into his neck and used the hair at the nape of his neck to hold on to. Draco heard her whisper a sleepy, soft, against his neck. Draco gave Daphne an awkward one-armed hug and clapped Theo on the back. Draco, holding Rose and Hermione, took the flu back to Spinner's End. They all went straight to bed upon arriving home. Tomorrow had the possibility of being a long day, and they needed their rest to be fully prepared. Author chapter end notes for this chapter, I wanted to let you guys know that there is actually a lot of really good information on the coat of arms and this personal seals that were presented in this chapter um, in the AO3 um, writing itself. So if you have not already had the AO3 version and you are following along, I would suggest going to pull it up and you can see a lot about each individual coat of arms and why she chose um, the character.